Hello, this is Brooks Lamp, Assistant Professor of English and the Writing Program Director, and this is a short introduction to the Close Skills lesson on definition and distinction. So you've now written your first close reading essay, and maybe you've found some aspects of that process fun, like finding patterns and under-the-surface meanings. On the other hand, you may have found it challenging to form an argument from patterns in texts, and you are likely on the right track if you find it a little bit challenging. Because if you're trying to go for a well-supported reasoned argument, it can be difficult. The kind of reasoning you're doing when you're arguing from patterns in a close reading paper is called inferential reasoning. And to do solid inferential reasoning, the first and most important step is to be on firm ground with the terms you're using. So this lesson, which is about how definition and distinction can help make your interpretation stronger by clarifying the important terms that you're working with in a close reading, is aimed at helping you think about that concept. So in this lesson, I'll show you some examples of how defining and differentiating can strengthen your written arguments, such as the ones you'll be writing coming up in a few weeks in this course and throughout the rest of the semester. First, I want to tell you a story about a squirrel. Some years ago, being with a camping party in the mountains, I returned from a solitary ramble to find everyone engaged in a ferocious metaphysical dispute. The corpus of the dispute was a squirrel, a live squirrel, supposed to be clinging to one side of a tree trunk, while over against the tree's opposite side, a human being was imagined to stand. This human witness tries to get sight of the squirrel by moving rapidly round the tree. But no matter how fast he goes, the squirrel moves as fast in the opposite direction and always keeps the tree between himself and the man, so that never a glimpse of him is caught. The resultant metaphysical problem is this. Does the man go round the squirrel or not? He goes round the squirrel, sure enough, and the squirrel is on the tree, but does he go round the squirrel? In the unlimited leisure of the wilderness, discussion had been worn threadbare. Everyone had taken sides and was obstinate, and the numbers on both sides were even. Each side, when I approached, therefore, appealed to me to make it a majority. Mindful of the scholastic adage that whenever you meet a contradiction, you must make a distinction, I immediately sought and found one as follows. Which part is right, I said, depends on what you practically mean by going round the squirrel. If you mean passing from the north of him to the east, then to the south, then to the west, and then to the north of him again, obviously the man does go round the squirrel for he occupies these successive positions. But if, on the contrary, you mean being first in front of him, then on the right of him, then behind him, then on the left, and finally in front again, it is quite as obvious that the man fails to go round him, for by the compensating movements the squirrel makes, he keeps his belly turned towards the man all the time, and his back turned away. Make the distinction and there is no occasion for any further dispute. You are both right and both wrong according as you conceive the verb to go round in one practical fashion or the other. Although one or two of the hotter disputants called my speech a shuffling evasion, saying they wanted no quibbling or scholastic hair-splitting, but meant just plain honest English round, the majority seemed to think that the distinction had assuaged the dispute. This fun little story illustrates in a simple way how important making distinctions can be. The trick of the story, of course, relies on an ambiguity in the definition of the word round, and looking up the word in a dictionary wouldn't actually have settled the argument, since the dictionary contains both 
of the different kinds of meanings they were arguing over and even other possible definitions of the word. So it really wasn't about the dictionary definition. It was more about how they wanted to agree about the term and how they were using it. As a writer, when the meaning of a word matters, such as a key term in your argument, you may need to clarify it and then stick to that meaning in the rest of your essay or your study. Anthony Weston, author of the Rulebook for Arguments, points out that in difficult cases, terms can be so vague or ambiguous that they are unhelpful as terms in arguments. For example, the dictionary definition of headache is a pain in the head. This is far too broad. A bee sting or a cut on your forehead or your nose would be a pain in the head, but not a headache. For some terms, you can be more precise yourself. For instance, you can say or clarify that organic foods are foods produced without chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Definitions like this call a clear idea to mind and offer the reader something that you can investigate or evaluate in your argument and you can be sure to stick to this definition as you go along. But in still more difficult cases, terms might be contested. This is when people argue over the application of the term itself. Often, these are very polarizing terms like abortion. When this happens, it's not enough simply to propose a clarification of the word. You need a more involved kind of argument. When a term is contested, you can distinguish three relevant sets of things. One set includes the things to which the term clearly applies. The second includes those which, to which the term clearly does not apply. And in the middle will be the things whose status is unclear, including the things being argued over. And your job is to formulate a definition that, one, includes all the things that the term clearly fits, two, excludes all the things that the term clearly does not fit, and three, draws the clearest possible line between, somewhere in between and explains why the line belongs there and not somewhere else. For example, consider what defines a bird. What is a bird anyway? Is it a bat? Is a bat a bird? A good definition of bird would have to include all the specific the species that are birds while excluding bats and other bird-like animals. In coming up with a definition like this, the question is precisely what differentiates birds, all birds, and only birds from other animals. It's trickier than it may seem. We can't draw the line at flight because of ostriches and penguins and so on. What distinguishes all birds and only birds, it turns out, is having feathers. These rules can be very helpful as a technique for the kind of inferential reasoning you're doing in your essays. And you can use examples of things in these three categories as a method of explaining and clarifying your terms. Here's how Weston uses this method for the term slow. The definition of slow will depend on context. Suppose we are defining slow in the context of vehicles used for everyday travel, like commuting to work or going to the grocery store. A golf cart with a top speed of about 15 miles per hour is clearly slow. A Tesla Model S with a top speed of over 130 miles per hour is clearly not slow. A Vespa LX50 scooter with a top speed of 39 miles per hour is a borderline case. It's fast for a scooter, though relatively slow for riding on highways. One plausible definition of slow for a vehicle is unable to maintain a speed of at least 20 miles per hour. Using this, this definition, Vespas and similar vehicles don't count as slow since they can achieve speeds of more than 20 miles per hour, but golf carts do count as slow. This seems to fit our sense of slow and fast vehicles, since Vespas could keep up with cars and motorcycles on most roads, but golf carts couldn't. Using this process of finding cases that are clearly in, cases clearly out, and borderline cases, you can more effectively get to the crucial 
ambiguities, the roots of what makes your term tricky and clarify that, that, the, that criteria. For instance, what is the definition of adult? If we apply Weston's strategy, we could work from cases of per- persons that are clearly adults, let's say like 40-year-olds. We could find cases of clearly not adults, maybe like 8-year-olds. But the interesting question is about borderline cases. What about 18-year-olds? 18-year-olds living away from parents. What about 15-year-olds living away from parents? What about 25-year-olds living with parents? Going through this process can make can cl- get you to the question of exactly what underlying criteria defines adult. Does adult have something to do with age? Something to do with maturity, maturity or autonomy or something like that? Working through a few practice terms in this way will help you get comfortable with using definition and distinction as an explanatory strategy for your analysis. Some terms you'll use to practice with in your activity assignment include terms that are interestingly ambiguous in our society, such as natural or made in America. And there are some terms on the activity that are relevant for the book we are reading in this unit, Endo Silence. What is the definition of silence, for instance? This term is, uh, the protagonist of the novel is going to think a lot about. The second part of the activity asks you to find an example of a distinction being made in your assigned reading this week and identify the two ideas being distinguished analyzing the similarities and differences between them. For example, in My Name is Asher Lev, Asher Lev opens his story by saying, I am an observant Jew. Yes, of course observant Jews do not paint crucifixes. As a matter of fact, observant Jews do not paint at all in the way that I am painting. Asher, Asher is suggesting something really central to who he is by making an implied but kind of unclear distinction between two kinds of painting. What is the way in which Asher paints, and what is the other ways of painting that he is distinguishing his way from? If you were going to analyze this distinction, you'd need to define what two kinds of painting he is referring to here and discuss the similarities and differences between them. In the activity, you'll find an example of how to analyze distinctions like this, and you'll practice doing this sort of analysis on a few different passages from course texts. As you can see, being able to analyze distinctions like this can be very helpful in close reading. And looking for where a writer makes these kinds of distinctions and thinking about why she or he might be making them can help you get more sophisticated as a reader. You can and should apply this strategy in your next close reading essay. When a writer uses a word that stands out because it is tricky, ambiguous, or vague, there's usually something going on worth investigating. And when you're doing your own writing, choosing the right word for your thesis statement, for example, you can apply these strategies to make clear to your reader exactly what you mean by your term and why you've chosen it. Good luck with your activity and for uh, your upcoming reading for this unit and your next close reading essay.